Chapter Four of Kipps by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Chapter Four. One. The hour of the class on the following Thursday found Kipps in a state of nearly incredible despondency. He was sitting with his eyes on the reading room clock, his chin resting on his fists and his elbows on the accumulated comic papers that were comic, alas, in vain. He paid no heed to the little man in spectacles glaring opposite to him, famishing for fun. In this place it was he had sat night after night, each night more blissful than the last, waiting until it should be time to go to her, and then bliss. And now the hour had come and there was no class. There would be no class now until next October, it might be there would never be a class so far as he was concerned again. It might be there would never be a class again, for Shulford, taking exception at a certain absent-mindedness that led to mistakes, and more particularly to the ticketing of several articles in Kipps' Manchester window upside down, had been on to him for the past few days in an exceedingly onerous manner. He sighed profoundly, pushed the comic papers back, they were rent away from him instantly by the little man in spectacles, and tried the old engravings of Folkestone in the past that hang about the room. But these two failed to minister to his bruised heart. He wandered about the corridors for a time and watched the library indicator for a while. Wonderful thing, that, but it did not hold him for long. People came and laughed near him, and that jarred with him dreadfully. He went out of the building, and a beastly cheerful barrel-organ mocked him in the street. He was moved to a desperate resolve to go down to the beach. There it might be he would be alone. The sea might be rough and attuned to him. It would certainly be dark. If I had a penny I'm blessed if I wouldn't go and chuck myself off the end of the pier. She'd never miss me. He followed a deepening vein of thought. Penny, though, it's tuppence he said after a space. He went down Dover Street in a state of profound melancholia, at the pace and mood, as it were, of his own funeral procession, and he crossed at the corner of Tontine Street, heedless of all mundane things. And there it was that fortune came upon him, in disguise and with a loud shout, the shout of a person endowed with an unusually rich, full voice, followed immediately by a violent blow in the back, his hat was over his eyes, and an enormous weight rested on his shoulders, and something kicked him in the back of his calf. Then he was on all fours in some mud that fortune, in conjunction with the Folkestone Corporation, and in the pursuit of equally mysterious ends, had heaped together even lavishly for his reception. He remained in that position for some seconds, awaiting further developments, and believing almost anything broken before his heart. Gathering at last that this temporary violence of things in general was over, and being perhaps assisted by a clutching hand, he arose and found himself confronting a figure holding a bicycle and thrusting forward a dark face in anxious scrutiny. "'You aren't hurt, matey!' gasped the figure. "'Was that you hit me?' said Kipps. "'It's these handles, you know,' said the figure with an air of being a fellow sufferer. "'They're too low!' And when I go to turn, if I don't remember, Biff, and I'm into something. Well, you give me a one in the back anyhow, said Kipps, taking stock of his damages. I was coming down hill, you know, explained the bicyclist. These little Folkestone hills are a fair treat. It isn't though I'd been on the level. I came rather a whop. You did that, said Kipps. I was back peddling for all I was worth anyhow, said the bicyclist. Not that I am worth much back peddling. He glanced round and made a sudden movement, almost as if to mount his machine. Then he turned as rapidly to Kipps again, who was now stooping down, pursuing the tail of his injuries. Here's the back of my trouser leg all tore down, said Kipps, and I believe I'm bleeding. You really ought to be more careful. The stranger investigated the damage with a rapid movement. Holy smoke, so you are! He laid a friendly hand on Kipp's arm. I say, look here, 
come up to my diggings and sew it up i'm of course i'm to blame and i say his voice sank to a confidential friendliness here's a slop don't let on i ran you down haven't a lamp you know might be a bit awkward for me kipps looked up towards the advancing policeman the appeal to his generosity was not misplaced he immediately took sides with his assailant he stood up as the representative of the law drew nearer he assumed an air which he considered highly suggestive of an accident not having happened all right he said go on right you are said the cyclist promptly and led the way and then apparently with some idea of deception called over his shoulder i'm tremendous glad to have met you old chap it really isn't a hundred yards he said after they had passed the policeman it's just round the corner of course said kipps limping slightly i don't want to get a chap into trouble accidents will happen still oh rather i believe you accidents will happen especially when you get me on a bicycle he laughed you aren't the first i've run down not by any manner of means i don't think you can be hurt much either it isn't as though i was scorching you didn't see me coming i was back peddling like anything only naturally it seemed to you i must have been coming fast and i did all i could to ease off the bump as i hit you it was just a treadle i think came against your calf but it was all right of you about that policeman you know that was a fair bit of all right under the circs if you'd told him i was riding it might have been forty bob forty bob i'd have had to tell him time is money just now for mr h c i shouldn't have blamed you either you know most men after a bump like that might have been spiteful the least i can do is to stand you a needle and thread and a clothes brush it isn't everyone who'd taken it like you scorching why if i'd been scorching you'd have coming as we did you'd have been knocked silly but i tell you the way you caught on upon that slop was something worth seeing when i asked you i didn't half expect it biff right off cool as a cucumber had your line at once i tell you that there is a many men would have acted as you have done i will say that you acted like a gentleman over that slop kipps's first sense of injury disappeared he limped along a pace or so behind making depreciatory noises in response to these flattering remarks and taking stock of the very appreciative person who uttered them as they passed the lamps he was visible as a figure with a slight anterior plumpness progressing buoyantly on knickerbockered legs with quite enormous calves legs that contrasting with kipps own narrow practice were even exuberantly turned out at the knees and toes a cycling cap was worn very much on one side and from beneath it protruded carelessly straight wisps of dark red hair and ever and again an ample nose came into momentary view around the corner the muscular cheeks of this person and a certain generosity of chin he possessed were blue shaven and he had no moustache his carriage was spacious and confident his gestures up and down the narrow deserted back street they traversed were irresistibly suggestive of ownership a suggestion of broadly gesticulating shadows were borne squatting on his feet and grew and took possession of the road and reunited at last with the shadows of the infinite as lamp after lamp was passed kipps saw by the flickering light of one of them that they were in little fenchurch street and then they came round a corner sharply into a dark court and stopped at the door of a particularly ramshackle-looking little house held up between two larger ones like a drunken man between policemen the cyclist propped his machine carefully against the window produced a key and blew down it sharply her lock's a bit tricky he said and devoted himself for some moments to the task of opening the door some mechanical catastrophe ensued and the door was open you'd better wait here a bit while i get the lamp he remarked to kipps very likely it isn't filled and vanished into the blackness of the passage thank god for matches he said and kipps had an impression of a passage in the transitory pink flare and the bicyclist disappearing into a further room 
Kipps was so much interested by these things that for the time he forgot his injuries altogether. An interval and Kipps was dazzled by a pink shaded kerosene lamp. You go in, said the red haired man, and I'll bring in the bike. And for a moment Kipps was alone in the lamp lit room. He took in rather vaguely the shabby ensemble of the little apartment, the round table covered with a torn red glass stained cover on which the lamp stood, a mottled looking glass over the fireplace reflecting this, a disused gas bracket, an extinct fire, a number of dusty postcards and memoranda stuck round the glass, a dusty crowded paper rack on the mantel with a number of cabinet photographs, a table littered with papers and cigarette ash and a siphon of soda water. Then the cyclist reappeared and Kipps saw his blue shaved, rather animated face and bright reddish brown eyes for the first time. He was a man perhaps ten years older than Kipps, but his beardless face made them in a way contemporary. Hugh behaved all right about that policeman anyhow, he repeated as he came forward. I don't see how else I could have done, said Kipps quite modestly. The cyclist scanned his guest for the first time and decided upon hospitable details. We'd better let that mud dry a bit before we brush it. Whiskey there is, good old Methuselah, Canadian rye, and there's some brandy, that's all right. Which will you have? I don't know, said Kipps, taken by surprise, and then seeing no other course but acceptance. Well, whiskey then. Right you are, old boy, and if you'll take my advice, you'll take it neat. I may not be a particular judge of this sort of thing, but I do know old Methuselah pretty well. Old Methuselah, four stars. That's me. Good old Harry Chitterlow and good old Methuselah. Leave them together, Biff is gone. He laughed loudly, looked about him, hesitated and retired, leaving Kipps in possession of the room and free to make a more precise examination of its contents. 2. He particularly remarked the photographs that adorned the apartment. They were chiefly photographs of ladies, in one case in tights, which Kipps thought a bit hot, but one represented the bicyclist in the costume of some remote epoch. It did not take Kipps long to infer that the others were probably actresses, and that his host was an actor, and the presence of the half of a large coloured playbill seemed to confirm this. A note framed in an Oxford frame that was a little too large for it, he presently demeaned himself to read. Dear Mr Chitterlow, it ran its brief course, if after all you will send the play you spoke of, I will endeavour to read it, followed by a stylish but absolutely illegible signature, and across this was written in pencil, What price Harry now? And in the shadow by the window was a rough and rather able sketch of the bicyclist in chalk on brown paper, calling particular attention to the curvature of the forward lines of his hull and calves, and the jaunty carriage of his nose, and labelled unmistakably Chitterlow. Kipps thought it rather a take-off. The papers on the table by the siphon were in manuscript. Kipps observed manuscript of a particularly convulsive and blottesque sort, and running obliquely across the page. Presently he heard the metallic clamour as if of a series of irreparable breakages with which the lock of the front door discharged its function, and then Chitterlow reappeared, a little out of breath, as if from running, and with a starry labelled bottle in his large freckled hand. "'Sit down, old chap,' he said. "'Sit down. I had to go out for it after all. Wasn't a solitary bottle left. However, it's all right now we're here.' "'No, don't sit on that chair. There's sheets of my play on that. That's the one, with a broken arm. I think this glass is clean, but anyhow wash it out with a squiz of siphon and shine it in the fireplace. Here, I'll do it. Lend it here.' As he spoke, Mr Chitterlow produced a corkscrew from a table drawer, attached and overcame good old Methuselah's cork in a style a bartender might envy, washed out two tumblers in his simple, effectual manner, and poured a couple of inches of the ancient fluid into each. Kipps took his tumbler, said thanks, in an offhand way, 
and after a momentary hesitation whether he should say here's to you or not, put it to his lips without that ceremony. For a space, fire in his throat occupied his attention to the exclusion of other matters, and then he discovered Mr. Chitterlow with an intensely bulldog pipe alight, seated on the opposite side of the empty fireplace, and pouring himself out a second dose of whisky. "'After all,' said Mr. Chitterlow, with his eye on the bottle, and a little smile wandering to hide amidst his larger features, "'this accident might have been worse. I wanted someone to talk to a bit, and I didn't want to go to a pub, leastways not a Folkestone pub, because as a matter of fact I'd promised Mrs. Chitterlow, who's away, not to for various reasons, though of course if I'd wanted to, I'm just that sort, I should have all the same, and here we are. It's curious how one runs up against people out of bicycling, isn't it? said Kipps, feeling that the time had come for him to say something. Here we are, sitting and talking like old friends, and half an hour ago we didn't know we existed. Leastways, we didn't know each other existed. I might have passed you in the street, perhaps, and you might have passed me, and how was I to tell that, put to the test, you would have behaved as decently as you have behaved? Only it happened otherwise, that's all. You're not smoking, he said. Have a cigarette. Kipps made a confused reply that took the form of not minding if he did, and drank another sip of old Methuselah in his confusion. He was able to follow the subsequent course of that sip for quite a long way. It was as though the old gentleman was brandishing a burning torch through his vitals, lighting him here and lighting him there, until at last his whole being was in a glow. Chitterlow produced a tobacco pouch and cigarette papers, and with an interesting parenthesis that was a little difficult to follow about some lady named Kitty, something or other, who had taught him the art when he was as yet only what you might call a nice boy, made Kipps a cigarette, and with a consideration that won Kipps's gratitude, suggested that after all he might find a little soda water an improvement with the whisky. "'Some people like it that way,' said Chitterlow, and then with voluminous emphasis, "'I don't.' Emboldened by the weakened state of his enemy, Kipps promptly swallowed the rest of him, and had his glass at once hospitably replenished. He began to feel he was of a firmer consistency than he commonly believed, and turned his mind to what Chitterlow was saying, with a resolve to play a larger part in the conversation than he had hitherto done. Also he smoked through his nose quite successfully, an art he had only very recently acquired. Meanwhile Chitterlow explained that he was a playwright, and the tongue of Kipps was unloosened to respond that he knew a chap, or rather one of their fellows knew a chap, or at least to be perfectly correct this fellow's brother did, who had written a play. In response to Chitterlow's inquiries, he could not recall the title of the play, nor where it had appeared, nor the name of the manager who produced it, though he thought the title was something about Love's Ransom, or something like that. "'He made five hundred pounds by it, though,' said Kipps. "'I know that.' "'That's nothing,' said Chitterlow, with an air of experience that was extremely convincing. "'Nothing may seem a big sum to you, but I can assure you it's just what one gets any day. "'There's any amount of money, any amount in a good play.' "'I dare say,' said Kipps, drinking. "'Any amount of money.' Chitterlow began a series of illustrative instances— he was clearly a person of quite unequal gift for monologue. It was as though some conversational dam had burst upon Kipps, and in a little while he was drifting along upon a copious rapid of talk about all sorts of theatrical things by one who knows all about them, and quite incapable of anticipating whither that rapid meant to carry him. Presently, somehow, they got to anecdotes about well-known theatrical managers, little Teddy Bletherskite, artful old chumps, and the magnificent behemoth. Petted to death, you know, fair sickened by all these society women. Chitterlow described various personal encounters with these personages, always with modest self-depreciation, and gave Kipps a very amusing imitation of old chumps in a state of intoxication. Then he took two more stiff doses of old Methuselah in rapid succession. Kipps reduced the hither end of his cigarette to a pulp, as he sat dissaying and quite believing, Chitterlow in the sagest manner, 
and admiring the easy way in which he was getting on with this very novel and entertaining personage. He had another cigarette made for him, and then Chitterlow, assuming by insensible degrees more and more of the manner of a rich and successful playwright being interviewed by a young admirer, set himself to answer questions which sometimes Kipps asked, and sometimes Chitterlow, about the particulars and methods of his career. He undertook this self-imposed task with great earnestness and vigour, treating the matter indeed with such fullness that at times it seemed lost altogether under a thicket of parentheses, footnotes and episodes that branched and budded from its stem. But it always emerged again, usually by way of illustration, to its own digressions. Practically it was a mass of material for the biography of a man who had been everywhere and done everything, including the on Thomas Norgate, which was a record, and in particular had acted with great distinction and profit. He dated various anecdotes, when I was getting thirty or forty or fifty dollars a week, throughout America and the entire civilised world. And as he talked on and on in that full, rich, satisfying voice he had, and as old Methuselah, indisputably a most drunken old reprobate of a whisky, busied himself throughout Kipps, lighting lamp after lamp, until the entire framework of the little draper was illuminated and glowing like some public building on a festival, behold Chitterlow and Kipps with him, and the room in which they sat were transfigured. Chitterlow became in very truth that ripe, full man of infinite experience and humour and genius, fellow of Shakespeare and Ibsen and Metalink, three names he had placed together quite modestly far above his own, and no longer ambiguously dressed in a sort of yachting costume with cycling knickerbockers, but elegantly, if unconventionally attired, and the room seemed to be a small and shabby room in a Folkestone slum, and grew larger and more richly furnished, and the fly-blown photographs were curious old pictures, and the rubbish on the walls the most rare and costly bric-a-brac, and the indisputable paraffin lamp a soft and splendid light. A certain youthful heat that to many minds might have weakened old Methuselah's starry claim to a ripe antiquity vanished in that glamour. Two burnt holes and a claimant darn in the tablecloth, moreover, became no more than the pleasing contradictions natural in the house of genius. And as for Kipps, Kipps was a bright young man of promise, distinguished by recent quick, courageous proceedings not too definitely insisted upon, and he had been rewarded by admission to a sanctum and confidences, for which the common prosperous, for which society women even, were notoriously sighing in vain. "'Don't want them, my boy. They simply play old Harry with the work, you know. Chaps outside, bank clerks and university fellows, think the life's all that sort of thing. Don't you believe them. Don't you believe them. And then, boom, 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 right in the middle of a most entertaining digression on flats, who joined touring companies under the impression that they are actors, Kipps much amused at their flatness, as exposed by Chitterlow. Law, said Kipps, like one who awakens, that's not eleven. Must be, said Chitterlow. It was nearly ten when I got that whisky. It's early yet. All the same, I must be going, said Kipps, and stood up. Even now, maybe, fact is, I had no idea. The house door shuts at half past ten, you know. I ought to have thought before. Well, if you must go, I tell you what, I'll come too. Why, there's your leg, old man, clean forgot it. You can't go through the streets like that. I'll sew up the tear, and meanwhile, have another whisky. I ought to be getting on now, protested Kipps feebly. And then Chitterlow was showing him how to kneel on a chair, in order that the rent trouser leg should be attainable, and old Methuselah on his third round was busy repairing the temporary eclipse of Kipps' arterial glow. Then suddenly Chitterlow was seized with laughter, and had to leave off sewing to tell Kipps that the scene wouldn't make a bad bit of business in a farcical comedy, and then he began to sketch out the farcical comedy, and that led him to a digression about another farcical comedy of which he had written a ripping opening scene, which wouldn't take ten minutes to read. It had something in it that had never been done on the stage before, 
and was yet perfectly legitimate, namely a man with a live beetle down the back of his neck, trying to seem at his ease in a room full of people. "'They won't lock you out,' he said in a singularly reassuring tone, and began to read and act what he explained to be, not because he had written it, but simply because he knew it was so on account of his exceptional experience of the stage, and what Kipps also quite clearly saw to be, one of the best opening scenes that had ever been written. When it was over, Kipps, who rarely swore, was inspired to say the scene was damn fine about six times over, whereupon, as if by way of recognition, Chitterlow took a simply enormous portion of the inspiring antediluvian, declaring at the same time that he had rarely met a finer intelligence than Kipps. Stronger there might be, that he couldn't say with certainty as yet, seeing how little after all they had seen of each other, but a finer never. That it was a shame such a gallant and discriminating intelligence should be nightly either locked up or locked out at ten, well, ten-thirty then, and that he had half a mind to recommend old somebody or other, apparently the editor of a London daily paper, to put on Kipps forthwith as a dramatic critic in the place of the current incapable. "'I don't think I've ever made up anything for print,' said Kipps. "'Ever. I'd have a thundering good try, though, if ever I got a chance. I would that. I've written window tickets often enough, made them up and everything, but that's different. You'd come to it all the fresher for not having done it before. And the way you picked up every point in that scene, my boy, was a fair treat. I tell you, you had knocked William Archer into fits.' Not so literary, of course, you'd be, but I don't believe in literary critics any more than in literary playwrights. Plays aren't literature. That's just the point they miss. Plays are plays. No, that won't hamper you anyhow. You're wasted down here, I tell you, just as I was before I took to acting. I'm hanged if I wouldn't like your opinion on these first two acts of that tragedy I'm on to. I haven't told you about that. It wouldn't take me more than an hour to read. 3. Then, so far as he could subsequently remember, Kipps had another, and then it would seem that suddenly, regardless of the tragedy, he insisted that he really must be getting on, and from that point his memory became irregular. Certain things have remained quite clearly, and it is a matter of common knowledge that intoxicated people forget what happens to them. It follows that he was not intoxicated. Chitterlow came with him partly to see him home, and partly for a freshener before turning in. Kipps recalled afterwards very distinctly how in Little Fenchurch Street he discovered that he could not walk straight, and also that Chitterlow's needle and thread in his still unmended trouser leg was making an annoying little noise on the pavement behind him. He tried to pick up the needle suddenly, by surprise, and somehow tripped and fell, and then Chitterlow, laughing uproariously, helped him up. "'It wasn't a bicycle this time, old boy,' said Chitterlow, and that appeared to them both at the time as being a quite extraordinarily good joke indeed. They punched each other about on the strength of it. For a time after that, Kipps certainly pretended to be quite desperately drunk and unable to walk, and Chitterlow entered into the pretense and supported him. After that, Kipps remembered being struck with the extremely laughable absurdity of going downhill to Tontine Street in order to go uphill again to the Emporium, and trying to get that idea into Chitterlow's head, and being unable to do so on account of his own merriment or Chitterlow's evident intoxication. And his next memory after that was of the exterior of the Emporium, shut and darkened, and as it were frowning at him with all its stripes of yellow and green. The chilly way in which Shulford glittered in the moonlight printed itself with particular vividness on his mind. It appeared to Kipps that that establishment was closed to him for evermore. Those gilded letters, in spite of appearances, spelt finis for him, and exile from Folkestone. He would never do wood carving, never see Miss Walshingham again, not that he'd ever hoped to see her again, but this was the knife, this was final. He had stayed out, he had got drunk, there had been that row about the Manchester window dressing only three days ago. In the retrospect, he was quite sure that he was perfectly sober then, and at bottom extremely unhappy, but he kept a brave face on the matter nevertheless, 
and declared stoutly he didn't care if he was locked out. Whereupon Chitterlow slapped him on the back very hard and told him that that was a bit of all right and assured him that when he himself had been a clerk in Sheffield before he took to acting, he had been locked out sometimes for six nights running. "'What's the result?' said Chitterlow. "'I could go back to that place now and they'd be glad to have me. "'Glad to have me,' he repeated, and then added, "'That is to say, if they remember me, which isn't very likely.' Kipps asked a little weakly, "'What am I to do?' "'Keep out,' said Chitterlow. "'You can't knock em up now. "'That would give you right away. "'You'd better try and sneak in in the morning with the cat. "'That'll do you. "'You'll probably get in all right in the morning "'if nobody gives you away.' "'Then for a time, perhaps as the result of that slap in the back, "'Kipps felt decidedly queer, "'and acting on Chitterlow's advice "'went for a bit of a freshener upon the lees.' After a time he threw off the temporary queerness and found Chitterlow patting him on the shoulder and telling him that he'd be all right now in a minute and all the better for it, which he was. And the wind having dropped and the night being now a really very beautiful moonlight night indeed and all before Kipps to spend as he liked and with only a very little tendency to spin round now and again to mar its splendour, they set out to walk the whole length of the Lees to the Sandgate lift and back, and as they walked Chitterlow spoke first of the moonlight transfiguring the sea, and then of moonlight transfiguring faces, and so at last he came to the topic of love, and upon that he dwelt a great while, and with a wealth of experience and illustrative anecdote that seemed remarkably pungent and material to Kipps. He forgot his loss, Miss Walshingham, and his outraged employer again. He became, as it were, a desperado by reflection. Chitterlow had had adventures, a quite astonishing variety of adventures in this direction. He was a man with a past, a really opulent past, and he certainly seemed to like to look back and see himself amidst this opulence. He made no consecutive history, but he gave Kipps vivid, momentary pictures of relations and entanglements. One moment he was in flight, only too worthily in flight, before the husband of a Malay woman in Cape Town. At the next he was having passionate complications with the daughter of a clergyman in York. Then he passed to a remarkable grouping at Seaford. "'They say you can't love two women at once,' said Chitlow. "'But I tell you,' he gesticulated and raised his ample voice, "'it's rot! Rot!' "'I know that,' said Kipps. "'Why, when I was in the smalls with Bessie Hopper's company, there were three. he laughed, and decided to add, "'Not counting Bessie, that is.' He set out to reveal life as it is lived in touring companies, a quite amazing jungle of interwoven affairs it appeared to be, a mere amorous wine-press for the crushing of hearts. "'People say this sort of thing's a nuisance and interferes with work. I tell you it isn't. The work couldn't go on without it. They must do it. They haven't the temperament if they don't. If they hadn't the temperament, they wouldn't want to act. If they have, biff. You're right, said Kipps. I see that. Chitterlow proceeded to a close criticism of certain historical indiscretions of Mr. Clement Scott respecting the morals of the stage. Speaking in confidence, and not as one who addresses the public, he admitted regretfully the general truth of these comments. He proceeded to examine various typical instances that had almost forced themselves upon him personally, and with a special regard to the contrast between his own character towards women and that of the Honourable Thomas Norgate, with whom it appeared he had once been on terms of great intimacy. Kipps listened with emotion to these extraordinary recollections. They were wonderful to him. They were incredibly credible. Of course the tumultuous, passionate course was the way life ran, except in high-class establishments. Such things happen in novels, in plays, only he had been fool enough not to understand they happened. His share in the conversation was now indeed no more than faint writing in the margin. Chitterlow was talking quite continuously. He expanded his magnificent voice into huge guffaws, he drew it together into a confidential intensity. It became drawingly reminiscent. He was frank, 
frank with the effect of a revelation, reticent also with the effect of a revelation, a stupendously gesticulating, moonlit black figure, wallowing in itself, preaching adventure and the flesh to Kipps. Yet withal shot with something of sentiment, with a sort of sentimental refinement very coarsely and egotistically done. The times he had had, even before he was old as Kipps, he had had innumerable times. Well, he said with a sudden transition, he had sown his wild oats. One had to some when, and now he fancied he had mentioned it early in the evening, he was happily married. She was, he indicated, a born lady. Her father was a prominent lawyer, a solicitor in Kentish Town, done a lot of public house business. Her mother was second cousin to the wife of Abel Jones, the fashionable portrait painter, almost society people in a way. That didn't count with Chitterlow. He was no snob. What did count was that she possessed, what he ventured to assert without much fear of contradiction, was the very finest, completely untrained contralto voice in all the world. But air it properly, said Chitterlow, you want a big hall. He became rather vague and jerked his head about to indicate when and how he had entered matrimony. She was, it seemed, away with the people. It was clear that Chitterlow did not get on with these people very well. It would seem that they failed to appreciate his playwriting, regarding it as an unremunerative pursuit, whereas, as he and Kipps knew, wealth beyond the dreams of avarice would presently accrue. Only patience and persistence were needful. He went off at a tangent to hospitality. Kipps must come down home with him. They couldn't wander about all night with a bottle of the right sort pining at home for them. You can sleep on the sofa. You won't be worried by broken springs anyhow, for I took them all out myself two or three weeks ago. I don't see what they ever put them in for. It's a point I know about. I took particular notice of it when I was with Bessie Hopper. Three months we were, and all over England, North Wales, and the Isle of Man, and I never struck a sofa in diggings anywhere that hadn't a broken spring. Not once, all the time. He added almost absently, It happens like that at times. They descended the slant road towards Harbour Street and went on past the Pavilion Hotel. 4. They came into the presence of old Methuselah again, and that worthy, under Chitterlow's direction, at once resumed the illumination of Kipp's interior with the conscientious thoroughness that distinguished him. Chitterlow took a tall portion to himself with an air of asbestos, lit the bulldog pipe again, and lapsed for a space into meditation, from which Kipps roused him by remarking that he expected an actor has a lot of ups and downs like now and then, at which Chitterlow seemed to bestir himself. Rather, he said, and sometimes it's its own fault and sometimes it isn't. Usually it is. If it isn't one thing, it's another. If it isn't the manager's wife, it's bar bragging. I tell you things happen at times. I'm a fatalist. The fact is, character has you. You can't get away from it. You may think you do, but you don't. He reflected for a moment. It's that what makes tragedy psychology, really. It's the Greek irony, Ibsen, and all that, up to date. He omitted this exhaustive summary of high-toned modern criticism, as if he was repeating a lesson while thinking of something else, but it seemed to rouse him as it passed his lips, by including the name of Ibsen. He became interested in telling Kipps, who was indeed open to any information whatever about this quite novel name, exactly where he thought Ibsen fell short, points where it happened that Ibsen was defective, just where it chanced that he, Chitterlow, was strong. Of course, he had no desire to place himself in any way on an equality with Ibsen. Still, the fact remained that his own experience in England and America and the colonies was altogether more extensive than Ibsen could have had. Ibsen had probably never seen one decent bar scrap in his life. That, of course, was not Ibsen's fault or his own merit, but there the thing was. Genius, he knew, was supposed to be able to do anything or to do without anything. Still, he was now inclined to doubt that. 
he had a play in hand that might perhaps not please William Archer, whose opinion, after all, he did not value as he valued Kipp's opinion, but which he thought was at any rate as well constructed as anything Ibsen ever did. So with infinite deviousness, Chitterlow came at last to his play. He decided he would not read it to Kipps, but tell him about it. This was the simpler, because much of it was still unwritten. He began to explain his plot. It was a complicated plot, and all about a nobleman who had seen everything and done everything, and knew practically all that Chitterlow knew about women. That is to say, all about women, and such like matters. It warmed and excited Chitterlow. Presently he stood up to act a situation which could not be explained. It was an extremely vivid situation. Kipps applauded the situation vehemently. That's damn fine, said the new dramatic critic, quite familiar with his part now, striking the table with his fist and almost upsetting his third portion in the second series of Old Methuselah, "'That's damn fine, Chitlow!' "'You see it?' said Chitlow, with the last vestiges of that incidental gloom disappearing. "'Good, old boy. I thought you'd see it, but it's just the sort of thing the literary critic can't see. However, it's only a beginning.' He replenished Kipps and proceeded with his exposition. In a little while it was no longer necessary to give that over-advertised Ibsen the purely conventional precedents he had hitherto had. Kipps and Chitlow were friends, and they could speak frankly and openly of things not usually admitted. Anyhow, said Kipps, a little irrelevantly, and speaking over the brim of the replenishment, what you read just now was damn fine. Nothing can alter that. He perceived a sort of faint, buzzing vibration about things that was very nice and pleasant and with a little care he had no difficulty whatever in putting his glass back on the table. Then he perceived Chitterlow was going on with the scenario, and then that old Methuselah had almost entirely left his bottle. He was glad there was so little more Methuselah to drink, because that would prevent him getting drunk. He knew that he was not now drunk, but he knew that he had had enough. He was one of those who always know when they had had enough. He tried to interrupt Chitterlow to tell him this, but he could not get a suitable opening. He doubted whether Chitterlow might not be one of those people who did not know when they had had enough. He discovered that he disapproved of Chitterlow. Highly. It seemed to him that Chitterlow went on and on like a river. For a time he was inexplicably and quite unjustly cross with Chitterlow, and wanted to say to him, you got the gift of the gab but he only got so far as to say the gift, and then Chitterlow thanked him and said he was better than Archer any day. So he eyed Chitterlow with a baleful eye until it dawned upon him that a most extraordinary thing was taking place. Chitterlow kept mentioning someone named Kipps. This presently began to perplex Kipps very greatly. Dimly but decidedly he perceived this was wrong. Look here, he said suddenly, what Kipps? This chap Kipps I'm telling you about. What chap Kipps you're telling which about? I told you. Kipps struggled with a difficulty in silence for a space. Then he reiterated firmly, What chap Kipps? This chap in my play, man who kisses the girl. Never kissed a girl, said Kipps, leastwise, and subsided for a space. He could not remember whether he had kissed Anne or not. He knew he had meant to. Then suddenly in a tone of great sadness and addressing the hearth, he said, My name's Kipps. Eh? Hey? said Chitterlow. Kipps, said Kipps, smiling a little cynically. What about him? He's me. He tapped his breastbone with his middle finger to indicate his essential self. He leant forward very gravely towards Chitterlow. Look here, Chitterlow, he said. You have no business putting my name into play. You mustn't do things like that. You'll lose me my crib right away. And they had a little argument, so far as Kipps could remember. Chitterlow entered upon a general explanation of how he got his names. These he had, for the most part, got out of a newspaper that it was still, he believed, lying about. He even made to look for it, 
and while he was doing so, Kipps went on with the argument, addressing himself more particularly to the photograph of the girl in tights. He said that at first her costume had not commended her to him, but now he perceived she had an extremely sensible face. He told her she would like Buggins if she met him. He could see she was just that sort. She would admit all sensible people would admit that using names in plays was wrong. You could, for example, have the law of him. He became confidential. He explained that he was already in sufficient trouble for stopping out all night without having his name put in plays. He was certain to be in the deuce of a row, the deuce of a row. Why had he done it? Why hadn't he gone at ten? Because one thing leads to another. One thing, he generalised, always does lead to another. He was trying to tell her that he was utterly unworthy of Miss Walshingham when Chitterlow gave up the search and suddenly accused him of being drunk and talking rot. End of chapter 4